there are gaps where we don't really use analytics. The goal could be and should be to provide clear input and communication across that whole supply chain. Capabilities are there, software tools are there. The industry can benefit from it on both ends, the users and the, the manufacturers. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Humpton, CEO of Siemens USA, and thanks for listening to The Optimistic Outlook. In the preview for our 2022 season, I ran through a number of topics we'll explore together. And one of those is this question of, how do we reinvent America's supply chain? We saw during the pandemic how at times we lacked adequate supplies of critical items. And what we're hearing about a lot more lately is a global shortage of semiconductors or chips that are in all types of products, devices, and systems that we rely on in US industry and infrastructure. I've asked some of our experts at Siemens to help us look at this challenge from a few different angles, from how to address the semiconductor shortage to opportunities in digital transformation to the importance of cybersecurity. We'll start today with Dave Gross. Dave recently joined our team as a strategic development portfolio executive for Siemens Digital Industries software. And he comes to Siemens with a vast experience in the semiconductor industry. Dave has been deeply involved for decades in the startup and operation of Greenfield semiconductor plants in the US and around the world. And before I share the discussion with you, let me just bring you inside how Siemens is thinking about this issue. You know, we're unique in that we're both a technology provider to manufacturers and we're reliant on chips in many of our products. We're trying to help solve this challenge as a provider of automation and digital tools that strengthen the case for localizing more production. And it's a new movement we're calling globalization. We're also part of the supply chain ourselves, working with more than 24,000 U.S. suppliers to deliver orders to our U.S. customers in all 50 states. So if you follow this series, you'll learn about how we can address bottlenecks and get things moving faster and more efficiently. But this conversation really addresses something even more fundamental. It addresses what I heard Commerce Secretary Raimondo say recently in describing what she called the long-term issue. And that quote, we just don't make enough chips in America. In fact, according to the Semiconductor Industry Association, the percentage of US made chips has fallen from 37% in 1990 to just 12% last year. Okay, so let's go ahead now and apply our optimistic outlook toward finding a path forward. You're gonna learn about the history of the semiconductor industry and the possibilities in adopting the latest technologies. We'll also get into why Siemens has been highlighting the opportunity for Congress to fully maximize funding for the Chips for America Act, action that would make a tremendous impact in growing the US semiconductor industry. Take a listen. Dave, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thanks, Barbara. It's, it's nice to be here. As we delve into this topic, I want to make sure listeners understand some of the terminology around semiconductors and chip production. We sometimes hear the words fabs or foundries. What do they mean? Yes, Barbara. The, the phrase fab refers to manufacturing uh, fabrication facilities. So fab is short for fabrication. In the fabs, we manufacture process technology, these operations within a fab run 24 hours a day, uh, round, round the clock, um, and, and that's what's referred to as a fab or semiconductor manufacturing. Regarding foundries, it's, a, it's an actual different business model, or it refers to a business model that defines a manufacturing operational environment. They can manufacture wafers, dye, products, so they, they do the same processing and process tech capabilities. But what the foundry model really is, is that it's typically used for fabless companies, companies that don't own any manufacturing capabilities. They bring their IT, IP to the manufacturing environment like a foundry, and the foundry then produces those um, products for the fabless companies or, or the customers. So there are a lot of specialties involved in this whole supply chain for semiconductors. And I think that's what we're going to get into a little bit in our conversation. I, I understand you have extensive experience being involved in the startup of Greenfield Fabs around the world. Tell us a little bit about your career so far. And I'm interested to know, after everything you've done in the semiconductor industry, 
What made you interested in coming to Siemens? I actually started in the semiconductor industry in an R&D facility. It was uh, United Technologies. And that's effectively what we were doing was product quality and reliability testing. This was in the U.S. During that employment, I also worked in their assembly test packaging facility. This, I worked in that environment and learned more about semiconductors, manufacturing. And then I left and went to Texas to join AMD and start up AMD's first manufacturing facility outside of California. And we, at that location, I started up fabrication and manufacturing abilities within five different factories over the course of uh, 15 years. My background is in equipment engineering, uh, manufacturing engineering. So in Texas, that's what I focused on. And then during those startups, uh, we completed the deliverables, and then I transitioned into a startup in Japan, still with AMD, working uh, remotely and traveling back and forth between Asia and America. And this was the first transition that I was experiencing where we started to offload products and designs to other areas outside the U.S., uh, then I transitioned into, um, still working for AMD, transitioned into IT systems engineering and automation engineering. And during this process, I actually went to Germany and started up two factories over in Germany. And then after those two, I returned back to the U.S. and in an IT OT integration role, I went to New York, upstate New York, and started up a factory, a 300 millimeter factory, which is now Global Foundries. So as, as I mentioned, I have a very diverse semiconductor experience delivering manufacturing solutions that are critical in establishing operational excellence in, in manufacturing environments. Uh, it's always been focused on semiconductors, but, but yet I had this desire to look across industries to see how to explore manufacturing and manufacturing industries. So being able to leverage Siemens strategy using state-of-the-art technology, integrating digitalization, simulation, uh, product design, manufacturing, analytics tools for evaluation to advise customers on how to realize value, I became enamored with what the capabilities were and where we could, where I could go within Siemens. Thank you so much for sharing that that uh, path of yours. And we're going to focus on solutions in just a minute. But first, help us understand the problem that needs to be solved. What's the state of U.S. semiconductor production today? What's changed and what drove that change? The semiconductor industry is still manufacturing in the U.S. Companies such as Intel, uh, Global Foundries, Texas Instruments, Micron Analog Devices, Microchip, Microchip Technologies, uh, Skyworks, and Skywater Technology, to name a few. These companies do manufacture semiconductors in the U.S. So what has changed, though? So, so there, there is a capacity gap within U.S. manufacturing. So over the course of you know, 20 years, there's been a lack of new semiconductor investments in the U.S., Cost is a key driver. Complexity is, is right there with it, but the cost of, of fabs has just grown tremendously and, and you have to make investments, so you have to decide where to make your investments. But the cost is also what changed the business model. The shift then was to go to a fabless model and be able to invest your capital dollars in technology development rather than hardware or cap capital that that you had to sink much money into uh, to build a new factory today. It's $10 billion investment. And, and it, the timeline is stretched out to uh, even receive your first revenue from that factory. It's over three years easy. In the early 2000s, there were 30 companies that manufactured leading edge technology in semiconductor. And due to the factors I mentioned, cost and complexity, this number today, there's really three major companies left that are manufacturing leading edge technologies effectively and efficiently, and that's TSMC, Intel, and Samsung. So you can start to see the, the complexity that technology is getting more and more complex, devices are getting more and shrinking, uh, but more and more capability in the same, same package, et cetera but at a much higher cost and a, and a lot longer timeline 
to build and prepare for investments in manufacturing. And Dave, all of these phenomena you've been explaining, the evolution within the industry, these things were all underway pre-pandemic. Now, add to that all of the disruption of a pandemic, when frankly, manufacturers didn't know how much demand there would be for their products and maybe turned around and and, uh, told the semiconductor manufacturing industry to slow down a bit. And now here we are with the need to actually rev things back up. And so now we really need to think both short-term and long-term about what comes next. What can we be doing right now? And what are the long-term actions we should take to address the challenge? Yes, the, the current chip shortage is really disrupting, as you alluded to, disrupting the industry businesses across uh, the value chain as OEMs and suppliers rush to procure reliable sources, chip sources. Uh, What we need is a more balanced risk sharing plan aligned across the business sectors, both in the consumers, the end users, and the suppliers of these devices to drive the value chain so that we're aware of what gaps there are and to help support the adoption rates within that supply chain. In short term, Manufacturing industry needs to collaborate and integrate their supply and demand intelligence with the end users, or I'll use an example of the automotive industry. With the automotive industry, being able to create the transparency of what they need, when they need it, both ways from the manufacturing side and from the end user side, the automobiles, combining that data from those sources driving to address the many segments within each business, there are gaps where we don't really use analytics. Uh, As amazing as it is in today's world, we have spreadsheets or, or different tools that aren't capable of showing the breadth of product pipeline. So the supply chain, so the visibility from the suppliers and the visibility to the end users is missing. It's error prone and it's manual. The goal could be and should be to provide clear input and communication across that whole supply chain. Capabilities are there, software tools are there. The industry can benefit from it on both ends, the users and the the manufacturers, and then focus on how to collaborate jointly on the issues. One of the, uh, again, the related to the automotive industry, uh, one of the gaps that occurred when the pandemic started was the automotive industry, the big companies actually pulled back their orders from the semiconductor manufacturers. They canceled their orders because they thought, you know, this was gonna, gonna be a while before we get through the pandemic. So business was gonna slow down. What happened, that just created an enormous gap in manufacturing. The fabs retooled or the manufacturing environments retooled to work on consumer products because the demand was so high that now when the automotive industry came back trying to fulfill their their needs, the fabs could not respond. And in fact, in many cases, didn't even have contracts because they were canceled. So that alignment and and visibility of the supply chain on both ends is really key and really important. So in the short term, that's something that that would be really beneficial. I want to comment on one other additional thing that I think is very important on, on this topic, and that is the workforce. The pandemic really caused quite a few issues within the industry. But one of the key issues that really highlighted is we we don't have the skills workforce available in scenarios like this. When we have to ramp a factory or start up or grow, provide the growth for the industry, we just don't have the capabilities to do that with the workforce we have currently. And this is not a new problem. We've understood this in semiconductor startups everywhere I've worked resourcing or or workforce was a challenge, but we always figured out how to do it. Now it's really highlighted the gap of skills in the workforce as far as a pipeline to be able to scale current and future workforce capabilities. So that was another 
outcome of the pandemic and, and the issues that came up around manufacturing. Thanks for the, the observations about both the, um, the industry interaction as well as the preparedness of the workforce of the future. You know, at Siemens, we've been supportive of maximally funding the Chips for America Act, which would provide funding and strategic direction to, I'll say, glocalize chips production to increase U.S. supply. And we're excited about the idea of creating that domestic chip assembly and test house to ensure we have the manufacturing know-how to make state-of-the-art chips. What does the next generation of chip production look like? And what capabilities do those state-of-the-art chips provide? So from a design, manufacturing, and supply chain perspective, a, a fully integrated end-to-end -end solution that would include security, efficiencies, and, and business transparency, as I was mentioning, really are what we need going forward. So if you, if you peel that back a little bit and say, let's talk about manufacturing first. Next generation manufacturing would be driving towards an integrated set of advanced software technologies. So e even the best state-of-the-art factories today still can benefit from advanced software technologies. And the, the digital innovations, the advanced analytics, I mentioned this before, automation, industrial IoT, industry 4.0, machine learning, artificial intelligence, cloud platforms. And these innovations have potential to boost productivity of existing companies, the old legacy operations. We can plug in or adapt and integrate solutions that exist today into the older environments to drive more efficient operations, therefore more product out the door, which is really what the investors want from their dollars that they've put into the business. These technologies support the creation of and enable business models to help increase those efficiencies and the logistics that go along with that that I was referring to earlier. You referenced Glocal. So what's interesting about Glocal is there are many companies that are global companies. They have factories and, and facilities around the world, but they still ship partial. They don't have a consistent end-to-end -end solution on one location or on one site. And the benefit that we have now after learning and experiencing these, these heartfelt issues around supply is we have an opportunity within the U.S. now with some funding to go after and build uh, chip, chip assembly and test facilities right in the U.S. It's happening in, in some areas. There's strategic technical advantages that, that can be leveraged from these state-of-the-art package technology development. In fact, there are companies, um, Skywater Technology has recently announced a, an integration effort with Bridge in Florida, and they're doing advanced packaging technology, chiplets, TSV, interposers, et cetera. These are advanced technologies that aren't in other countries in many cases. So we have an advantage over some of our foreign competitors in this space. However, we don't have the manufacturing capability in the United States to take advantage of it. We would end up shipping that technology overseas, having somebody manufacture with that technology, then ship it back. That's not a success factor near term. Uh, long term, maybe it is, but not near term. You want to retain that IP and that advanced capability early on for your customers, especially customers like uh, our government, you know, where, where we have different department entities we work with to provide semiconductors. So. Dave, you've talked to us about some of the capabilities that are going to be absolutely critical for the semiconductor industry. What are some of the unique aspects of this that Siemens can address? One of the things that Siemens has done, which is why I was excited when, when I first uh, was exposed to Siemens, is the ability that Siemens provides or brings to the table, I talked about design, I talked about manufacturing, um, about even assembly, test, et cetera. What Siemens offers are uh, solutions for managing that whole end-to-end -end solution. And uh, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. The end-to-end -end solution starts with a design or an idea. So that can be a fabulous company. It goes into manufacturing with a design kit, Man, the design kit is manufactured and then delivered to customers. 
through packaging and so on. Siemens has products that manage the design capabilities. You can simulate designs through process simulation and, and plant sim. You can measure and monitor the, the capabilities before you even invest in the product itself. What about the things that Mentor Graphics does, Dave? Is that something that, that you'd like to highlight as part of this? Mentor Graphics or Siemens products around EDA, engineering design uh, automation, really do enable the fabulous companies to come to market with products quickly. I mentioned earlier that a technology company has to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to develop a technology. Well, with the capabilities that Mentor Graphics and, and Siemens provide in this space, you can do that design capability before you invest the huge amount of, of money into the technology and do that through simulation. You can test the reliability, you can test the quality um, all virtually and through the capabilities that the EDA uh, tools bring that Siemens provides, this really is an efficient way to do design and then deliver the design kits or process the, the PDKs to manufacturing, both from uh, saving costs and then also improving the issues around complexity. So it, it's a win-win. It, using Mentor Graphics products enables the end users to really accelerate their designs and come to market faster. So Dave, I, I wanna end with the final question I use to close <clears throat> out each episode. If we're successful in applying everything you've discussed here, what does that mean, not only for the future of the semiconductor industry, but for the country? You would have access to a resilient, diverse and secure supply chain that would be able to ensure your economic prosperity and the national security requirements that I was just alluding to of concern. You could have that within the U.S. and, and manage that effectively. One of the key areas is around security of that data. So that would be part of it. The collaborative efforts to facilitate that range of supply and you know being able to stockpile and, and store products and manage those products in a safe way and be able to produce those accordingly or deliver those to your customers. It's essential for manufacturing. In regards to what may change too, so I mentioned workforce, the, the workforce is, is key to making this happen also. We have to invest in workforce. We have to upscale our resources. You know, people talk about automating factories. That in no way, I've been through this in, in several factories. In no, no case do you actually replace employees with robots or automation. What you do is you upscale those resources you help train them and move on to more and better roles of jobs and engineering and systems and design and technical leadership, et cetera. So coming back to the what, what else would come out of this, um, manufacturing operations would have that integrated strategy, the supply network, the end-to-end -end product development, planning and delivery, customer connectivity, Customers would know what's happening constantly uh, rather than find out when something's going to be late rather than when it's going to be or where it is today. These manufacturing operations scenarios uh, have a common thread of integration to multiple systems, and those can be managed and leveraged across businesses with software and software controls. And then I, I think... Finally, success in the semi semiconductor industry depends, you know, as I mentioned, on resources. You, you, we just can't overlook this. And it, it, it happens all too easy. But technology companies have a lot to overcome to build a, a more robust, more diverse workforce. We can leverage that workforce to innovate and maintain our critical technology capabilities and then also have a great work-life balance throughout the careers of individuals. Thank you so much, Dave, for sharing your expertise with us today. Thanks, Barbara. It was a pleasure talking to you. I hope you learned a lot in today's episode. And I hope that in hearing this, you're excited about what we could achieve by increasing U.S. chip production. You know that at Siemens, we're working to accelerate the transition to electric mobility. We're committed to manufacturing a million electric vehicle chargers in the U.S. over the next four years. 
We've even, we're even part of the first industry-backed coalition committed to 100% EV sales by 2030. Well, did you know that each electric vehicle has about 2,000 chips, twice the amount of chips in a traditional vehicle? Chips are integral to more than just the current strength of our economy. They're actually critical to the more sustainable future we're trying to build. And so if we can work together as an industry to advance digital transformation, if we can fully fund the CHIPS Act and do things like drive the development of a US-based CHIP technology center, I see the foundation for aggressive climate action. I see a new chapter for American manufacturing. And I also see a new generation of industry careers. We're ready to work with all of our partners across industry and government to begin moving this forward today. Thanks for listening. And please go to our show notes to learn more. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform or to the Siemens YouTube channel. And for show notes and more, go to Siemens.com slash optimist.